is the key in so many ways to what is happening with all its moons. Um, just to remind us, Saturn um, may appear to be what it is in the holographic world, that, but actually, again, it's an information field. It is a consciousness. Um, everything is aware. Everything has a consciousness. So these um, planets and suns, they have consciousness. They have awareness. They are entities in their own right. And interestingly, this is an accepted ancient symbol of the sun. <clears throat> and people think, understandably, that it's a symbol of the sun that we know today. But is that symbol more likely to be the sun we know today or the sun we once knew? Saturn. Saturn is the key to understanding uh, so much. Uh, it was known as the old sun, it is known in a cult as the old sun, the dark sun and the dark lord the Lord of the Rings. And the massive penny drop for me. Whoa, the kaleidoscope moved when I started to realize that at least so many, if not all, the ancient sun gods were not gods of the sun we know today, but of the Saturn sun that was focused on before because it was in a different position. Saturn has long been symbolized as an eye. There's the eye in Freemasonry. There's the eye of Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, the reptilian eye, the symbol of the negative force. And what uh, happened in the m massive and brilliant work of da uh, David Talbot in the Saturn myth is that at some point there was an enormous ejection of debris in an explosion out of Saturn. And it formed like a, a luminous uh, crescent because it, it reflected light at certain points of the, of the day. And this, as the Earth moved on its axis, when um, viewed from the Earth, this appeared to move around Saturn. And at different points, there are different symbolism for different points. But this was the one that really was the focus of Saturn symbolism because this was when that luminous crescent was at its most luminous during the day. And so you find this symbol over and over in the ancient world. And this is a common recurring theme of Saturn. And this the crescent symbolically and the disc of the Saturn sun, the dwarf star. And so from this came the horned god, the horned goddess. There is Madonna in her Super Bowl performance at halftime, which was so Saturn in its symbolism, it was laughable, including the fiery eye. And in the movie version of The Lord of the Rings, you had the crescent holding the eye of Sauron. In um, Arabia, or you look at that as the, um, the symbol of, of, of Islam, the star, the sun, and the crescent. And the uh, Arabian god uh, Sin was symbolized as a crescent. Here you go. And I would suggest from David Talbot's point of view, and I think he's right, that this represents the crescent of Saturn. This is a, the guy who started a satanic uh, Saturn uh, uh, organization or secret society out of uh, Germany called the Brotherhood of Saturn. And there's that uh, symbol of the sun look with a dot. That's Saturn, not the sun that we have today, and the horned god. Um, Molech, who is symbolized at Bohemian Grove as the owl, is also symbolized as the bull. And there's the horns with... Saturn in the middle and so you have the bull gods of Mesopotamia and the the winged goddesses in that uh, state this was often symbolized as the goddess with her uh, holding the god her arms around the god or her wings around the god um, and there is another uh, 
version of that with the, the, uh, the god Saturn and the, the crescent. And there it is on the great seal of the United States, exactly the same symbolism. There it is in the Air Force Special Operations Command. There it is in the symbol of the House of Windsor. There it is in the United Nations with the target on the world, um, very appropriately. There it is in the eagle of, the, of Rome. Here it is in Freemasonry. Um, the flying disc of Egypt and other places is Saturn. And thus you have the Rosicrucian order, which connects into this network uh, using that flying disc uh, symbolism. And so many of these logos carry the same uh, symbolism. And in her Super Bowl performance, Madonna had the flying disc um, of Saturn. This is another ancient Saturn symbol because at some points, apparently it seemed to give off four very distinct lights, which became known as the four corners or the four rivers or the four ways. And so you find it because of these bloodlines connecting into all these institutions, you find it in the Roman church, you find it on the mace in the houses of parliament, find it on the crown, you found it in the um, Celtic cross, and you find it in the, one of the major secret societies in the network, the House of Malta. It's known as the Maltese cross. It was also symbolized, this uh, Saturn symbol and crescent, as the uh, flying god in, in his flying boat. This is Horus in his heavenly boat. Um, this is why it's used in uh, the boats used in Freemasonry. This is a Freemasonic building on the Isle of Wight, funnily enough. And that is massive. I'm not saying Annie Lennox knew it was. Just let's do this. It'd be a good idea. But that was massively Saturn symbolism when you watched it play out. Then you've got this um, symbol of the, the horned god. Again, Saturn. Satan, as it also became known, uh, which is you find with so many politicians. And Pat Robertson, this so-called Christian evangelist. Yeah, okay. Um, and talking of horns and uh, horned gods... Um, in astrology, Saturn is connected to Capricorn, and so one of the Saturn symbols is the goat. This again is the great uh, Freemasonic historian Manly P. Hall who said Pan, the goat god, was a composite creature, the upper part with the exception of his horns um, being human, and the lower part in the form of a goat, the god himself is a symbol of Saturn because this planet is enthroned in Capricorn whose emblem is a goat. That is what that is, Baphomet, worshipped by Satanists. It's a symbol of Saturn. And I'm going somewhere with this because I'm going why they're focused on Saturn. So you have Baphomet, you have Beyonce, the wife of Jay-Z with this big Baphomet ring, which is performing. You have Baphomet dressed Lady Gaga, Baphomet dressed uh, Madonna, and you have uh, Baroness Philippine de Rothschild from the, the wineries in France uh, with a massive Baphomet um, bro uh, or um, necklace. And this is from the, the front cover of the Saturn myth with the symbolism described of these lights that went off from Saturn at certain points with the four main ones there. And there it is symbolized on one of these ancient tablets. And in St. Peter's Square, that is a mirror of the way that Saturn symbol uh, looks. And there it is on the thing that he has his biscuit in, um, there, when he's doing his stuff. Now, this is inside the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Great Queen Street. Great Queen was the name of the Babylonian goddess in London. Because, this will become sim uh, significant in part three, um, this crescent holding the sphere also became symbolized as twin pillars. And so you have Saturn, there's the crescent, being held up by the twin pillars. This is in the, one of the Freemasonic uh, centers of the world in London. Numerologically, digitally, Saturn is number eight. And uh, this has uh, led to symbolism of Saturn in terms of the spider. Thus you have, in Madonna's uh, Super Bowl performance, the winged disc uh, symbolized with a spider in the center. Now, this is fascinating. This is called the magic square of Saturn. And um, it's also, not by coincidence, the magic square of Freemasonry. And it's magic because of this reason. If you go that way, that way, that way, that way, or that way, or that way, 
all the numbers of in, in, in the three blocks in line add up to 15. And in numerology, uh, you keep adding uh, numbers um, until they become a single number. And so 15, in numerologically, uh, term, numerological terms, is 6. So 666, 666 in all directions. And um, the black and white squares, for reasons I'll, I'll have to go into in detail in a book, because, uh, you know, there's so much to get through today, also relates to Saturn. And so you have them in Freemasonic temples, black and white squares, and you have them in the major cathedrals, like Westminster Abbey and stuff, because of this connection I'm talking about. Now, this is called the sigil of Saturn. And they get this symbol by drawing in the magic square of Saturn from one to two, and then to three, from four to five uh, to six, etc. So they get it. Now you turn that straight up, and that's what that is. It's the sigil of Saturn. And this is a major symbol of Saturn going way back, the six-pointed star. It just so happens to be the very symbol from which we get the name Rothschild, one of the major families in this network. Because they used to be called Bauer. They lived in Frankfurt in Germany. But they had this red uh, six-pointed star um, hexagram on the front of their house and they changed their name to Bauer, from Bauer to Red Shield in German, Rothschild, Red Sign or Red Shield, uh, Rothschild. So they're named after this uh, very symbol. And it was they that created Israel, not on behalf of Jewish people, on behalf of their bloody agenda that, that treats Jewish people with as much disdain as any of the rest of us. And so you have their symbol on the flag of Israel. They use the six-pointed star so much in uh, law enforcement. This is on a public building in Toronto, right in the centre of the six-pointed star, there's the horned god. Um, there's the sheriff and a, a, a medal. There is the, uh, the six-pointed star representing Saturn on an ancient uh, uh, you know, uh, clay depiction. And there it is on Credo Mutwa's 500 to 1,000 year old Zulu um, hand symbol. Uh, you, if you do that on the uh, dollar bill, you get the six-pointed star and the, uh, that, those letters make an anagram of Mason, interestingly. Inside the Great Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Great Queen Street, London, there is the Twin Towers, symbolic of the Crescent, and there is Saturn again, the six-pointed star. Now, of course, the Roman Church and Christianity, that is uh, anti Freemasonry and anti-secret societies because they're naughty, but it's on his bloody fish hat, look. Right? They're everywhere because the same force is in control. Here you go, I have a bit more Madonna. Yeah, there you go. And, and in the, on the Great Seal of the United States, those 13 stars make up a six-pointed star, not by accident. And therefore, again, we keep coming back to this, all these different areas of society are only in the end focused on one thing. Satanism is Saturnism. Um, this is Fritz Springmeier, a, a long-time uh, researcher into this and uh, symbolism, etc., and Satanism. Saturn is an important key to understanding the long heritage this conspiracy has back to antiquity. The city of Rome was originally known as the Saturnia, or City of Saturn. The Roman Catholic Church retains much of, the, of Saturn worship in its ritual. Saturn also relates to Lucifer. In various occult dictionaries, Saturn is associated with evil. And uh, this is the remains of the uh, Temple of Saturn in Rome. And uh, just next to this is this place uh, called Capitoline Hill now, but before that called Mon Saturnus, the Hill of Saturn. And um, this is a very um, uh, symbolically important place to the bloodlines. And, and this whole thing about the skull and bones, uh, Capitoline Hill comes from cap, caput, meaning dead, because they were supposed to have found a, a human skull there, and they call it caput, Capitoline Hill. That's why we say caput when something's dead. And you have the theme in Christianity of Golgotha and Calgary, the place of the skull, hill of the skull. And Capitoline Hill became Capitol Hill when the bloodlines moved in on America. Now, in the North Pole, uh, the Northern Pole of Saturn, is a permanent storm which make, takes the form of a hexagon. 
And uh, this has been found uh, by the Cassini uh, spacecraft, and I think the Voyager one before that in the early 80s. And uh, the hexagon also is an expression of the hexagram, or uh, of the six-pointed star. Uh, because all these different symbols that I'm going to talk about now are different expressions of the same frequency state. So you look at this crop circle from uh, England this year, and it is a hexagon. But a hexagon is a flattened out cube. So when you look at it from another angle, it's a cube. Well, it just so happens that an ancient symbol of Saturn is the cube, especially the black cube. And I would suggest that's what they are. The Kaaba, the focus of worship in, in um, Islam, Kaaba means cube. The Teflin, the cube on the head in Judaism. And when people go to uh, worship around the Kaaba, they're told to pray in concentric circles. Remind you of anything? And they're told to walk around it and their energy can be trawled. And if you focus on something that represents Saturn, Saturn is where the energy goes. In, in Judaism, they have Solomon's temple. Every syllable of Solomon means the sun. And the Holy of Holies in the so-called Solomon's temple was supposed to be a cube. They talk in uh, Revelation about the new Jerusalem in cube terms. There's these massive cubes that they use. This is outside the... Um, uh, uh, one of the banks uh, near Wall Street, near where the protests are. And you see these black cubes and cubes like used by, uh, by Apple and stuff. Saturn symbolism. In uh, uh, Doctor Who, they had this recent one where they, we, the Earth was invaded by black cubes. Star Trek, you had the Borg, who were these cyborg-like, exactly as the, um, uh, are described by the, uh, the Gnostics of the Archons. And they used to move around in these cubes. If you uh, geometrically represent the cross, then it is a flattened out cube. When you look at the, uh, the uh, depictions of, 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 of these uh, people, not, not Lady Gaga, but others, these religious leaders with the halo, well, that comes from Saturn as well. That halo, when, when that luminous crescent was in that position. Astrologically, that's the symbol of Saturn. And what they uh, symbolized this as was the sickle and the hammer. And when the Rothschilds created um, the Soviet Union, provable fact if you look at the evidence, they used the symbol of Saturn as the symbol of the Soviet Union. There's the, that symbol on this guy from the Brotherhood of Saturn. The uh, Jesuits are a major secret society in this global network, and there's the symbol of Saturn in their uh, symbolism, very bloody clearly. The... Uh, the snake on the cross also relates to this in, in some ways. Now, this is going to take us uh, forward here because the god of Saturn of the Greeks was called Kronos. And Kronos was, because he was the god Saturn, the, the sickle, the scythe, was represented as uh, holding the scythe. And also, he was depicted as the god of time. And he had the beard, uh, the white beard. And he became Old Father Time. That's Kronos. That's the god of Saturn. He also became the Grim Reaper. Because Saturn is the planet, I say, son of death. Um, and Kronos became crown, a symbol of the bloodlines. Uh, uh, Kali, uh, a goddess related to Saturn, uh, it was called the Black One and uh, the, the Goddess of Time, depicted with a protruding tongue. There's Madonna again. I mean, she must have the bloody book she works through, this one. <laughs> the God El, the Hebrew God El, was their God of Saturn. So El and Elohim are Demiurge and Archons, I would suggest. So we have Archangel Els, Mike El, Gabriel, Yuri El, Raphael, Another name for Jesus, Emmanuel. We have the Gospels, Chapel, Elders, elevated to the priesthood. Elections, where pawns are elected to serve the elite. We have Isis, Ra, El, the all names relating to Saturn. Saturn, Kronos, Satan, Black Sun, Dark Lord, they're all the same thing. The expression of this force. And here you have Moloch. That they worship at Bohemian Grove, and he is a god of Saturn, this recurring theme. They also represent um, Moloch as a bull, as I said earlier, and so you have that as the uh, symbol of Wall Street. 
And the golden calf in the Bible is Moloch, Saturn. The Greeks talked about Saturn uh, used to eat his own children. And here's the colours of Satanism and the colours of Saturn, black and red, same as the royal protocol. The, the robes of the judge, the robes of the uh, clergy, the, the square hats of um, uh, universities, the, the, the hammer that the judge uses, it's all Saturn symbolism. You see Saturn profusely used in symbolism of the corporate world. And this, well, this earth, wind and fire, they got the bloody set. Um, there's the eye, there's the six pointed star, there's the step pyramid, there's the winged disc and there's bloody Saturn. And then, therefore, you look at religions and secret societies and Satanism, they're worshipping Saturn. Then you look astrologically, in other words, energetically. Banking is astrologically ruled by Saturn. Politics and institutions of state at all levels, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Corporations, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Law and court system, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Science, astrologically ruled by Saturn. Saturn worship, Satan worship. And it's interesting that you have the uh, god of Saturn, uh, Kronos, with the beard, and, and represent, and all these bloody religions, they have bloody beards. And then you have God depicted, depicted as a man with a white beard on a cloud or on a throne. And there's God, Charlton Heston type God. That's Yahweh depicted with a with beard and stuff. And then we have Santa with the white beard. Santa, anagram of Satan from Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a festival in Rome where they worshipped the god Saturn and they gave, uh, it was in the same period to the run up to our Christmas and they gave gifts, they decorated trees and they hung sprigs of bloody holly. So that is Saturn symbolism, a man with a white beard. This is Ancient of Days, a painting by William Blake from I think 1794 or something like that. Ancient of Days is an old name for God. And he's depicting God. He was a very deep esoteric thinker and, and great knowledge, uh, William Blake. And uh, he's depicting God with the white beard. That's Saturn, Kronos. On the GE building in the Rockefeller uh, Center in New York, there's Kronos again. Now, the Freemasons, they call their God the great architect of the universe. The Demiurge was known by the Gnostics as the great architect of the universe. Which brings us to the white bearded architect of the Matrix, in the Matrix movie series. So where is this leading us? Well, again, this needs to go if we're going to go anywhere with this, because I'm going into fantastic areas here. But this is where the information has taken me very, very clearly. Um, and the hardest thing to see is what is in front of your eyes, as this man rightly said. The Gnostics talked about the fact that the Archons make something appear to happen that does not actually happen. They can induce a virtual reality experience. The uh, Islamic people and pre-Islamic people talk about the jinn manipulating humans by creating illusions. I was uh, in New York in 2010 and someone took me to the subway station for Ground Zero. And when I saw it, it was like, whoa, it hit me big time. There was, first of all, this eyes all along the platforms. But there is this massive depiction of the world on the floor. And then there's an eye. And going out from this eye are these broadcast transmissions. And that hit me so powerfully. And Neil Haig was with me. And we kind of looked at each other and said, that's Saturn, isn't it? And... Remember, physicists have said uh, only this last few days, they may have evidence the universe is a computer simulation. Well, I say that it's a virtual reality, which has been hacked into, and that hack is the reality that we're experiencing, the fake reality. And that hack, I say, comes from Saturn. Because I'm saying that these rings are actually a massive broadcast transmission system which is broadcasting a fake reality within the frequency range that we are decoding and therefore we are picking up that uh, fake reality. 
When the Cassini spacecraft arrived at Saturn in 2004, um, found many things that was unexplainable. You know, things like the, the hexagon North Pole storm and stuff like that. But they also found extraordinarily powerful sound coming from Saturn. This is, this is part of what they recorded. Nice man. Um, and I got uh, sent this by a sound engineer, works in sound engineering for a living. And it's one of the rings of Saturn. And he said, I see that every day. That's bloody sound. They're sound waves. And this is in cymatics. This is a six pointed star. And of course, we have the hexagon going round and round and round at Saturn's North Pole. This is a standing wave created by sound, rings. Uh, this is at the south pole of Saturn and it's a permanent ice storm. This is a standing wave created by sound. And these are symbols created by sound, like cymatics. And a certain frequency created this perfect six-pointed star with the hexagon in the middle and the hexagon there. Therefore, the sound creates the frequency, uh, creates the symbol, and in the same way, the symbol represents the sound and the frequency. The, the, the symbols are just holographic representations of vibrational waveform states. I would suggest in this, these symbols cases, representatives of the sound frequency coming off Saturn. Same with all these symbols and numerological manipulations. The sound and the symbol are different expressions of the same thing. Thus, if we in the holographic realm are constantly bombarded with these symbols, it is on an energetic level feeding us the frequency field of what they represent. And Saturn, when described pre-cataclysmic, didn't have rings. So where'd they come from? Well, maybe it had rings, but it weren't rings we could see. We can see them now. Well, this guy, Norman Bergeron, has a long, he's in his 90s now, I think. He has a long, long history in space research, technological research, going way back. And his life changed when he started studying the pictures that came back from the Voyager 1 and 2 space uh, expeditions to Saturn. They arrived in 1981. Because when he studied them, he realized there was something very strange about Saturn's rings. And he said this in his book, The Ringmakers of Saturn. Several years ago, a number of folks in the astrology and uh, astronomy rather and physics world began theorizing that these rings had to be much younger than the universe, perhaps only about 100 million years old. But one pair of pictures shows a change in five minutes. An impression is conveyed that the latest reported measurements purport to be the true ones, when in reality, all might uh, quite nearly be correct at the time of observation. General reluctance to accept variable ring system geometry occurs because of apparent failure to identify a physical mechanism suitable for producing recurrent change. In other words, classic mainstream science, if we can't explain it, we'll kid ourselves it doesn't exist. And he also found these in the pictures coming back from Voyager, and the Cassini ones found them too. And he calls them electromagnetic vehicles, and they are massive. Some of them several times bigger than the Earth. But again, we need to move our sense of perception. In terms of size uh, representation, this is the Earth against the size of Saturn. They're not, talk, they're not talking the same perception of big um, in terms of 
outside of the Earth. And here are some of the other pictures of these electromagnetic vehicles picked up by these NASA craft. Why aren't they all in the papers being talked about? You think, what the hell is this? No, no, nothing. Thanks to Berggren, we've, we've, we've seen the, their existence. This is the uh, Hubble uh, telescope. Let's pick one of them up. Look at the size of the bloody thing. And uh, here's a few Cassini uh, spacecraft pictures, still pictures put together. What the hell is that? Exactly what Berggren was describing from Voyager. And this is the other thing. He found pictures of stuff spewing out of these electromagnetic vehicles into the rings of Saturn and bloody making them or extending them. And what is said to be in the rings of Saturn, I guess thus that's why we can see them, um, is like ice and stuff. I think and I would suggest that eventually they will realize that there is a crystal substance being put into those rings that has a dramatic impact on their ability to transmit information. In 2009, NASA um, released this picture, which is uh, a ring around Saturn, which is from 3.7 million uh, miles out to uh, 7.4 million. And that ring could encompass a billion Earths. I suggest that there are rings that we can see, but there are sound rings that we can't see that are coming out across and we're picking them up. They make something appear to happen that does not actually happen. They can induce a virtual reality experience. The Saturn matrix, as I call it, is a frequency band, which we are decoding as a fake reality. And I suggest, my view, we will find that the edge of that frequency band is what we call the speed of light. And beyond it, you go out of the matrix. And when all the genetic tinkering that the ancients talked about went on, the human form was being manipulated to be tuned in to receive and transmit within the frequency band of this Saturn broadcast. And pulling people from a heart state beyond the matrix into an emotional uh, uh, point of interaction Ba uh, massively in the matrix was a major way of tuning us into this fake reality. We talk about people who don't think for themselves as being in the box. Maybe we ought to say that they're in the cube. And they want to shut the heart down, and they have to so many people, because it takes us beyond the bounds of time and space, beyond the matrix, because I suggest that what we call time as we decode it is in this matrix transmission. I'll whip through this quickly because um, I've talked about this in my books at great length, and I've talked about this at Under London Talks. But um, I, I, I say the moon is a construct or a part construct. Um, this is a book called Who Built the Moon by Christopher Knight and Alan Butler. It's absolutely brilliant in the way that it uh, puts the case for the moon not being uh, real in terms of a natural body. But interestingly, what they find in that book is the mathematics and geometry between the sun, the moon, and the earth are fantastic in terms of their synchronicity, and it does not apply in any way to the rest of the solar system. And the Gnostic writings found in Nag Hammani in 1945, 1,600 years old or more, say that this is a separate system operating within the Archon system of the inorganic universe. They say in the book, um, the authors, the mass involved in the earth, moon, sun system is nothing less than staggering. With, uh, and that the uh, moon has been put there with the accuracy of the proverbial Swiss watchmaker. So when viewed from the Earth, it's the size of the sun at an eclipse. The BBC did a, uh, a program, who built, uh, Do We Really Need the Moon? And it said the moon is now in a perfect position to sustain life on Earth and its effect on the Earth, but it's just a coincidence. I think not. We only see the near side of the moon. We don't see the far side of the moon. And the authors say in that book, the moon is bigger than it should be, apparently older than it should be, uh, much lighter in mass than it should be. It occupies an unlikely orbit and is it so extraordinary that all existing explanations for its presence are fraught with difficulties and none of them could be considered remotely watertight. The mainstream theory is that the Earth was hit by a Mars-type planet when it was forming and a chunk came off and became the moon, called the WAC theory. 
That didn't pan out, so they came up with a double whack theory where it was hit by the planet, it went away and gave it another smack, and then it became the moon. Now, of course, it doesn't pan out because it's nonsense. They don't know. Why don't they just say it's not a bad thing we don't know? There's lots of things we don't know. Um, the best explanation for the moon is observational error. The moon doesn't exist, said this uh, scientist at the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's easier to explain the non-existence of the moon than its existence, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. And, and you know, I'll, I'll go through this because um, I don't want to run over too much uh, time. I'll just mention a few things about the moon. Um, these two scientists from the Soviet Academy of Sciences wrote a detailed article in 1970 uh, headed, Is the Moon the Creation of an Alien Intelligence? And they explained in scientific terms um, why the Moon cannot be a natural body and in doing so explained all the anomalies that if it is a natural body cannot be explained. Um, this guy, Sergeant Wolf, talked at the National Press Club a few years ago and told of his experiences on the inside at NASA where he saw uh, 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 things like um, alien bases on the Moon and stuff like that. And all, there's all these towers and strange phenomena, like this blue light called blue gem or blue uh, dome that they can't explain on the moon. And these artifacts on the moon that clearly are not natural. Look at that one. What the bloody hell is that? They can't explain it. They don't talk about them. These are pictures of what are claimed to be statues on the moon. There's so much we don't know. In symbolic terms, maybe in a bit more than that, the moon is a bit like the Death Star of this big time insider, George Lucas, in, in the sense that it's actually some kind of technological construct. And it's my view, as I've said before in previous books, that what the moon is doing, in its present use anyway, is taking this Saturn broadcast and acting as an amplifier to fire it at the Earth, so we get it in massively increased power and therefore effect. It's acting a bit like a, uh, a, uh, a dish transmitting uh, information which we're picking up and decoding into a fake reality. Now, um, nine months after I've written that in a book called The uh, Human Race Get Off Your Knees, someone sent me a, um, an email from Brazil, I think it was, a lady, and said, have you read this book, Earth, by Barbara Massiniak? Because I've just read your book and I think you'd find it interesting. And she sent me some page numbers. Barbara Massiniak is what they call a channel. And lots of channels are not channels. Uh, they just think they are, but you know, if you get a genuine one, then you can, you can get out there and bring information in, out from other dimensions into this one. You can get some profound information that way. And she's done a lot of great stuff, uh, Barbara Massiniak. I've met her a few times. Anyway, I, I hadn't read Earth. I'd read the first book um, that she, she wrote, but, but not um, Earth. Anyway, I sent for it. I went through the page numbers and I'm like, whoa, this is nine months after I've said this stuff in... Um, Human Race Get Off Your Knees. And uh, this was a channeled book, and this is what was in the book. 1996, I think this came out. The moon is a very powerful electromagnetic computer. The energy from the moon has been beaming electromagnetic frequencies onto the Earth for eons now to maintain the two-stranded DNA. The moon is a satellite that was constructed. It was anchored outside Earth's atmosphere as a mediating and monitoring device, a supercomputer or eye in the sky. Earth must be owned by those who dwell there. However, it is not. You have outside gods, creator energies, who prevent you as a species from having free reign with your kundalini. That's the, the energy of awakening, in effect. The influence of the moon as a main satellite computer affects all of the Earth. The moon's programs have for eons been of great limitation towards human beings. There are repetitive cycles that the moon creates to which you respond. The tales about the full moon and insanity, madness and heightened bleeding are all quite true. You know that television influences you a great deal. The moon is the same way. And astrologically, just as a very quick aside, when that great um, rearrangement happened, of course, astrologically, everything changed as well in terms of the influence of the astrological energies upon the human perception. Because suddenly all these bodies are in different positions to where they were before. So. The Saturn moon matrix, as I call it, I say anyway, is um, generating a frequency band, a, a fake reality, which we are decoding to be what seems to be a real reality. And the genetic manipulation has tuned us into it and created this cycle of round and round the garden. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, as the guy said in the video. And uh, Neil Haig has this um, concept of moonopoly. 
uh, or Saturn Moonopoly. And it goes like this. You get up in the morning and you have your breakfast and then you go to work. And then you have your lunch, sandwich normally, and then I go to work and then I go home and then I have my tea and then I watch a bit of telly and then I go to bed. Then I get up and I go to work and then I have my lunch, sandwich normally. And I mean, look at us. We are infinite consciousness, infinite awareness. All that is, has been and ever can be. Is that all we are capable of? No, but we are locked into these cycles to which we respond. No response. See it as you couldn't see it before. An end to work, buy, consume, die. That's what that is. And this matrix creates a firewall that holds us from seeing further into the energy field and holds us in this tiny frequency band we call visible light. What they've done is taken the, uh, the, uh, the universal energy field, the universal construct, and they have hijacked, hacked into it, and they're feeding a fake reality to us from within that construct. And, and therefore, it's goal. Oh, my life's in a terrible state. I'm just making adjustments to my life. Oh, life's great. And they're all freaking illusions. Um, we're like in this wall. The, you know those scientists that have been suggesting in the last few days that um, the universe might be a computer simulation? They actually said, like a prisoner in a pitch black cell, we may never be able to see the walls of our prison. Why? Because they are vibrational walls, and I suggest that they are the speed of light. Which is not the fastest speed. Sorry, Einstein, mate. It's pedestrian. We're talking all possibility, darling. And so when we look into the night sky, are we seeing what's real or are we seeing a projection? I talked to him, I think it was my last book or the one before that. I had a profound experience as a little boy when I was first taken to the London Planetarium, when I looked and saw the night sky on the roof of the planetarium and it looked so bloody real. And, and it, it it's hit me and it's never left me that actually when I look at the night sky, that ain't actually what I'm looking at. Firewall. All that we see or seem is just a dream within a bigger dream. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? Caught in the landslide, no escape from reality. Open your eyes, look at the skies and see. Is it a sky or is it a projection? And so when we come to the matrix and this scene in the matrix, I call it the Saturn moon matrix, maybe connected to other things we don't know yet. This is so, so real, and so, so the world we live in. If you add two words. The Saturn moon matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neil. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. Archon world. We live in Archon world. Um, I'm going to bring this down now before we, we have a break. I'll bring this down into the world that we live in now. Um, this guy, a great cosmologist, who knew far more than he was saying or was allowed to say, um, uh, Carl Sagan, he wrote a book, The Dragons of Eden, in which he talked about... Um, the fundamentally uh, importance of understanding the reptilian impact of reptilian genetics on human behavior. Because uh, the reptilian brain fundamentally affects human behavior. And I suggest that before the genetic tinkering, either that wasn't there or was nothing like as, as powerful as it is now. And I came across these books after I was a long way down the line. I came across these books by Carlos Castaneda, in which um, he was... Um, quoting a Central American shaman called Don Juan Matters. And when I read some of the stuff in these books that this shaman had said, it was like, whoa, we talk about confirmation. He talks about the archons and the jinn in exactly the same terms, but he calls them the flyers. But they're the same, uh, they're the same entities. And this is what he said about them in the books. We have a predator 
that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands we don't do so. Indeed, we are held prisoner. They took over us because we are food to them, energy. And they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their sustenance. Just as we rear chickens in coops, the predators rear us in human coops, human eros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. Think, matters said for a moment, and tell me how you would explain the contradictions between the intelligence of man the engineer and the stupidity of his systems of belief or the stupidity of his contradictory behaviour. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of beliefs, yes, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who have set up our dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetedness, greed and cowardice. It is the predator who makes us complacent, routinary and egomaniacal, feeding the wolf. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators have engaged themselves in a stupendous manoeuvre. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist, a horrendous manoeuvre from the point of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. They gave us their mind, and that, I suggest, is how they've done it. And they also, more than gave us our mind, they gave us their frequency via junk or non-coding DNA. We are at last, hallelujah, brother and sister, having mainstream scientists seeing the blatant, beyond belief, obvious, that... 98% of DNA, which they have called junk because they didn't know what it did and said it had no function, actually does, stands back in amazement, have a function. And in that 98% of DNA, non-coding DNA, uh, is our programs, behavior programs, uh, perception programs, emotional programs, that if we are not beyond mind, body, conscious, we lock into and they become us. People in that state, I suggest, it is very possible, and I say highly likely, they can go through an entire human lifetime and not have an original thought or emotional response that isn't coming from the program. This is um, Boston University and Harvard Medical School research. They examined 37 DNA sequences containing at least 50,000 base pairs and one with 2.2 million base pairs. Lead researcher Eugene Stanley, non-coding DNA sequences do contain a structured language fundamentally unlike the coding in genes. We therefore need to consider the possibility that the junk DNA may carry some kind of message. Yes, it does, many. And one of them is the human control system when we're pulled into body-mind. Russian DNA research. It appears that the languages we were looking for are in fact hidden in the 98% junk DNA contained in our own genetic apparatus. The basic principle of these languages is similar to the language of holographic images based on the principles of laser radiations of the genetic structures which operate together as a quasi-intelligent system. And this uh, recent uh, announcement by this uh, institute at the Harvard Medical School all data that humanity creates in a year can be stored on four grams of DNA. That's how much information we have in the human structure. And therefore, if you can put emotional programs, emotional response programs into the, uh, into the genetic structure and then create a society designed to constantly trigger those programs, then you can have a massive constantly recurring a tidal wave of low vibrational emotional energy. And when you, to, to feed off, and when you go beyond the body, like with Jill Bolte Taylor earlier, all these near-death experiences, what is the common theme when, we go, when they go beyond the body? I felt calm, at peace, I just was. There was no thought, 
pattern and no human emotion. Because so much of it is coming from the body. It's a program. And when you go into the heart and you go beyond time and space, you stop reacting in the, in the sense of the program and you stop delivering the food, the sustenance of that which is behind it. I did not judge and did not feel I was judged. I loved being in that painless state of existence. And if you want to feed off human energy, low vibrational, if you've got these programs within the human genetic structure generating that energy, well, you're home and bloody dry. This is the mind that we've been connected to. Why do rules have power over our minds? It's all about rules, because it's all about control. And this part of the brain, the reptilian brain, where we get cold-blooded behavior, territoriality, desire to control, might, right is might, and all that stuff, um, might is right, um, that is massively part of the reaction system. Because the reptilian brain is about survival. It's about constantly scanning the environment for threats to survival. Not just physical survival, but survival financially, survival of the job, survival of the relationship. Uh, be afraid, be very afraid, because the big man of monsters coming as soon as we've invented him. This is why we're constantly given reasons to be frightened, because that locks us into the reptilian brain and therefore into this collective mind. And Don Juan Matter said, I know that even now, though you never have suffered hunger, you have food anxiety, which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that at any moment now its manoeuvre is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which after all is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them. And they ensure in this manner a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Sorcerers of ancient Mexico reason that man must have been a complete being at one point, with stupendous insights, feats of awareness that are mythological legends nowadays. Absolutely. And then everything seems to disappear, and we have now a sedated man. What I'm saying is that what we have against us is not a simple predator. It is very smart and organized. It follows a methodical system to render us useless. Man, the magical being that he is destined to be, yes, and she, uh, is no longer magical. He's an average piece of meat. There are no more dreams for man than the dreams of an animal who is being raised to be a piece of meat, trite, conventional, imbecilic. Control of perception. And if you look at the Avatar movie, it is so symbolic because you had the heart society and it was taken over this connected society of greater awareness was taken over by this left brain, merciless, heartless invasion by symbolically earth troops with their technology and all that stuff. And you even had the symbolism of these uh, invaders infiltrating the blue people society by operating inside an outer shell of blue people so that they didn't know that they were being infiltrated. Now. Are we, as a human race, there are seven billion of us now and more, the number of people in full knowledge who are behind this are tiny, tiny. And they can only do it by dividing and ruling us. Are we going to stand up, come together and face this, or look the other bloody way and go on walking into a level of enslavement that would make George Orwell bloody wince? As, as uh, Martin Luther King said, a man can't ride your back unless it's bent. Freedom is the sure possession of those alone who have the courage to defend it.